I'm glad you brought up insulin resistance. That's where I was going next. I think it's really important we get into the nuances there, like metabolic health, often talked about, but I feel like a lot of people still don't fully understand that. And this brings me to the five tests that we talked about earlier. You talk about another test in the book that you recommend, which is fasting insulin. So let's talk about why that is, and then we'll pivot into insulin resistance and why that's at the core of a lot of this. Yeah. So again, a fasting insulin level will show us the process of insulin resistance developing at its early stages. Insulin resistance as a concept, again, not very well understood. And we really don't look at insulin resistance. We look at the end effects of insulin resistance. So the end effects of untreated insulin resistance are things like type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure. And these are the conditions that we diagnose people with a problem. Uh, But if we look at insulin resistance itself, we can figure out who is on the pathway to those problems much earlier. We can make the changes that improve it, and we can prevent these problems from occurring in the first place. And, you know, I believe and the data would support that if we were to aggressively treat insulin resistance, we can significantly reduce the amount of heart disease that we experience. Would you argue that insulin resistance is at the core of metabolic health and that those five tests we talked about are just another way of looking at insulin resistance in a different way? Yeah, no, that's very much true. You know, all of those changes that occur in those blood, in those metrics that we talked about, the waist circumference, the blood pressure, the blood glucose, the cholesterol profile, those are all because of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is the physiologic condition that leads to all of these things. So those metrics are just our way to figure out who is insulin resistant. Um, And so, uh, and again, a fasting insulin level is another indicator that points to insulin resistance. So this is getting to the root cause of troubles instead of the usual approach of the healthcare system these days, which is just trying to treat the symptoms, treat the end effects, and not really thinking about what the underlying process is and how we can address the underlying root cause of disease. Well, there's an inherent problem within the five tests, one being that we're looking at blood glucose instead of insulin, right? which, which we know the issue there is that you can control blood glucose to an extent by increasing the insulin produced by the body. And that can go on for years masking problems. So if you actually go to the insulin, you can get to the root a lot earlier and see what's happening. Yes, definitely so. And that's why I advocate so strongly for people checking their fasting insulin levels, because it is the early indicator. And you're right, All these other things are kind of lagging indicators uh, of the underlying problem. Well, have you continue that story for me where somebody is, will use diet in this case, is neglecting their diet, having a lot of carbohydrates, processed foods, they're not regulating their blood glucose, so their insulin is all over the place. Talk about that insulin resistance piece and what the body does over time and how that leads to disease. Yeah, sure thing. So we need to understand why, you know, what is the role of insulin? What does our body use insulin for? And insulin is a hormone. It's, you know, referred to as one of the master hormones of the body. It does lots of different things. But two primary purposes for having insulin are to get sugar out of our bloodstream and to promote storage of energy, like I talked about, vital for our survival that we're able to store energy. And we know that sugar in high levels in our bloodstream is toxic. It's damaging to our blood vessels, and it has lots of other uh, negative effects when sugar builds up in the bloodstream. So the body uses insulin to get sugar out of the bloodstream and to be able to store energy. And what happens over time is if more and more sugar is coming into the system, 
the body is producing more and more insulin to get the sugar out of the bloodstream. This causes more and more energy to get stored. And at some point, what happens is those energy storage cells, which are called fat cells, uh, start to get full. And so they stop responding to the insulin. And because, you know, the sugar can't be put away as storage in the fat cells anymore, now it starts to build up in the bloodstream. And so at first, the body just makes more insulin to try and overcome this problem. Uh, this is, you know, but then, you know, it, it's a uh, sort of vicious cycle. We're making more and more insulin. The cells are responding less and less to that insulin. That's what insulin resistance is. And this now can cause disease in a number of different ways. It's going to cause disease directly because of that sugar building up in the bloodstream. Uh, high levels of insulin, insulin also start to have uh, direct effects on the lining of the blood vessels contributing to that damage. Inflammation occurs contributing to that damage. And the other thing that people sometimes fail to recognize is those lipid particles, those cholesterol particles that we're worried about, they actually get influenced by insulin and they start to change in a number of ways that make them more, we call it atherogenic, more likely to build up in the plaques that are now occurring, you know, as those blood vessel walls are getting damaged. So it turns out that insulin resistance really explains the entire disease process, the entire disease continuum. And again, that gives us a much greater opportunity when we focus on the insulin resistance to prevent and even reverse uh, disease once it's occurring. We're really getting into the weeds here, and I really I'm enjoying the nuance to where this is going. The fact that blood sugar has its own problems that it causes in the body, and then insulin, as it continues to be produced more and more, is causing its own set of problems. And the thing about all this, and I think I touched on this quickly, but to get into more on that, the fact that this happens in the body oftentimes over a period of, say, 10 years. So your body is taking care of you, in essence, by making more insulin, getting that blood sugar out of the bloodstream. And it's causing all these this damage in the background that we're not aware of until it's not too late, but until we really have problems. Exactly. Exactly. And, and it's really, you know, the healthcare system is designed in such a way, it functions in such a way that we only pick up on these problems, as you said, when they are already advanced. Uh, doesn't mean it's too late, but sometimes it's too late. And other times it's just, you know, far along in the process. And now we have a lot of damage to deal with and to try and, you know, undo and compensate for. And I believe that we should be doing a much better job of diagnosing these things early, trying to reverse and prevent the disease from occurring than trying to treat disease. Because we have a problem, you know, and this is true here in the United States, this is true worldwide. We are running out of the resources that are necessary to take care of sick people. We have, you know, the, the healthcare system is overwhelmed. Uh, we don't have enough practitioners of all sorts. We don't have enough of the medications that, you know, go into taking care of, you know, into treating these patients in a traditional uh, manner. And we don't have the money, quite frankly, to take care. Uh, you know, this is all becoming more and more expensive and putting a bigger and bigger financial burden on society as a whole. And the only way we're going to get out of that is to make less sick people. Uh, so that is why I so strongly advocate for preventative efforts, for paying attention to these things, for diagnosing them early, evaluating them early, and then giving people the tools, empowering people to take back control of their health, like we talked about earlier, and doing a better job of preventing these problems from occurring in the first place. And we're going to do a good job of that, teaching people what they can do. But before we do that, let's continue this story all the way to the end. And unfortunately, what happens with people is they become, say, 10 years down the line, 
if they acquire type 2 diabetes at the time, the medical system may prescribe them with insulin and further facilitate this problem. And we know insulin is a growth hormone, so it's going to cause the person to gain weight and it's going to continue this vicious cycle. So further emphasizing what you're talking about here, prevention and giving people the tools so they don't have to go down this path, or if they are, give them another route out of it. Yeah. And, and you know, this is an interesting problem that arose because we were looking at the end effects instead of the root causes. So when we look at diabetes, you know, diabetes is diagnosed when your blood sugar is elevated. And most people are probably aware that we have two forms of diabetes. Uh, traditionally, they were called juvenile onset and mature onset. You know, now we usually call them type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes is typically occurs in younger people and their blood sugar is elevated. And the reason that their blood sugar is elevated is because their bodies have stopped producing insulin. So they have a lack of insulin. This was a fatal disease, uh, very hard to manage prior to the discovery of how to synthesize insulin, uh, you know, um, and then be able to administer insulin to people. And once that was discovered, uh, once we were able to administer insulin to type one diabetics, they got a lot better. The management of their disease improved, literally life-saving uh, therapy. What then started to happen is we had people who were developing high blood sugar later in life. And you know, we kind of assumed it was the same problem, that they weren't making enough insulin. For whatever reason, they weren't making enough insulin. But the reality is, is that they had been making too much insulin and had developed this insulin resistance. But because our focus is on keeping the blood sugar under control, the answer became give insulin or give other medications that can help lower the blood sugar. And what we really need to step back with people with type 2 diabetes and recognize is that the issue is that they're taking in too much sugar. They're taking in too much carbohydrate. And if you simply reduce the amount of carbohydrate that they're taking in, you can reduce the body's need to produce insulin. And actually, over time, you actually improve insulin sensitivity. The body starts responding to insulin better. But because we focus on the blood sugar, as opposed to focusing on the insulin part of this problem, it has led us to, like you said, a, a sort of nonsensical treatment where people have a problem of too much insulin and we want to give them more insulin. And this all comes back full circle to the five metabolic tests, the fact that we're looking at glucose rather than insulin. So we're looking at glucose and how to control that, but it's the wrong target. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, insulin, an insulin level would be one of those metabolic health metrics. Um, for whatever reasons, you know, that that did not occur historically and, you know, it has not changed. And we're focused on the blood glucose instead of the blood insulin levels. Which is still part of the picture, but... It's, it's just not the full picture. So correct. essentially what we're getting at here and giving clues to is we need to control the insulin. And when it comes to the diet piece, we talked about that being a big lever here. We need to control our carbs. So let's start to get practical here for somebody who right now at this point has been having a standard type diet, having quite a few carbs, and their blood glucose and insulin has run amok. Let's talk about what happens when they start to cut those carbs down, control the glucose and control the insulin. Yeah. So, you know, the effects that we see when people reduce their carbohydrate intake, uh, the first thing, you know, happens usually pretty quickly is their blood sugar levels start to come down. And because we're putting less sugar in, the body requires less insulin to deal with that blood sugar. And over time, the hyperinsulinemia, the high levels of insulin in the bloodstream can be reversed. They get better. And once 
the cells aren't being bombarded with so much energy, with so much insulin. Uh, and they've been given a chance now to release some of that stored energy. They start responding to insulin better. Uh, so they become more insulin sensitive. And then we can see, you know, all of those downstream effects start to improve. And that is the most powerful way to deal with insulin resistance. We really do not have medications that effectively, you know, reverse insulin resistance. And so this is truly a diet and lifestyle issue. And there are other lifestyle considerations that come into play. Diet is the big one. Diet is the primary one. And I always tell people, if you're not getting the diet right, it's you're not going to be able to overcome that no matter how much you focus on the other aspects of this. And the other aspects are things like the activities that you're getting, how much muscle that you have, good, getting good and adequate amounts of sleep, dealing with your stress. These are the other things that you know go into the process of improving and maintaining good metabolic health. But diet really has to be the foundation. And since it is the foundation, if somebody comes to work with you and they're, you know, overweight right now, they're insulin resistant, do you recommend just starting with the diet as to keep the person, the changes manageable and not overwhelm them? Well, it's usually the first, you know, aspect that we'll focus on. And and really, I should go back, you know, even before the dietary changes, uh, what I find is important is the mindset the understanding of why you're making these changes. Uh, So, you know, I I try and educate people on kind of all that we've been talking about. I try them to get to to get them to recognize why their health is so important to them. I want them to take ownership. I want them to have the reasons that they're improving their health because that's what's ultimately going to lead to success. The dietary changes then become the first sort of functional uh, thing we talk about. And again, we do that first because it's most important. uh, And it also impacts the other things. Once they start seeing the changes that occur from making the dietary changes, oftentimes that gives them the ability to be more active and it, you know, stimulates them to be more active. Uh, When your blood sugars are better controlled, you sleep better. And so it can take care of that. Uh, there, we are now starting to understand the very important relationship between metabolic health and mental health. And so when we see people improving their diets and going on low carbohydrate diets, we oftentimes see them getting better from a stress standpoint. Uh, them getting better from a mental health standpoint. And so it all starts to reinforce each other. Uh, But ultimately, the most powerful tool we have is the dietary changes. So for somebody that's tuned into this point, they understand now what's happening in the background. You mentioned the mental aspect. They're ready to make a change and they're motivated. We're going to get into dietary nuances here. But the only other roadblock I could see before we get into that is the hope piece. So for somebody who is, say, 300, 350 pounds, they've been, again, really neglectful for, you know, we could argue whether it's, you know, the information being fed down to them or choices they've made. That's we won't even get into that part. But what have you seen with people? And we're going to get into your story eventually. You're an example of this as well. Yeah. But for somebody that's feeling stuck right now and that they're broken, let's give them the hope and then we're going to give them the path they need to take. Yeah. And the hope that I want to give people is that, again, you have control over this. You have power over this. It's never too late to make these changes. I have seen elderly people, you know, 70s, 80s, even into their 90s, make changes and have amazing results. I have seen people with advanced stages of disease, people who have been on my operating table. They, you know, they need the open, they need the heart surgery that I do. We do the heart surgery, but they make these changes afterwards and they see amazing results. Uh, People who are morbidly obese uh, can see amazing results. Uh, So 
you know, and again, this is going to depend on what you're focused on. Uh, I always try and get people to understand that it's not all about weight. Uh, weight loss really becomes a side effect of improving your metabolic health. When you improve your metabolic health, when your insulin level comes down, that is what allows you to lose weight and specifically to lose fat, which is, you know, what our goal is. Uh, so all of these things are, can be improved, can be reversed. Yes, there are situ situations where we have damage that we might not be able to undo uh, fully, but you can always improve from wherever you're starting from. And again, you are in control of this. You can do this for yourself. You need a, the guides. You need the information that can empower you. But each one of us has the power to do this. And that's the good news. That's the hope that I try and give people every day. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. The first uh, 10 plus years as a heart surgeon, I was increasingly unhealthy. I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was destined for my own operating.